Mm-hmm. Just sort of like what Colin Kaepernick's going through right now. Right. You know, they, if they really wanted him to play, they would have sat down with him, they would have given him a standard issue, where they have no interest in him because they heard the profits. Right. What you learn as a 21-year-old, a youngster who was wide-eyed, you're living the dream, you already been named the starting center for the New York Giants, and the veterans ain't been coming to camp yet. Right. Uh, that's how far ahead I was of most of the other guys. Larry Zacchi came to see me and told me I was the best center I ever saw play the game, and I'm sitting there going better than uh, some other people that I, I looked up to, and he goes, oh, yeah. And it, so I kind of didn't realize that as a 21-year-old where I was. Right. Okay, but I had really trained hard, and, and it was in phenomenal shape, and really worked at it. Well, to turn around and be made the starting center, Okay, and then, you know, play over 100 plays in a controlled scrimmage, which means they're not running offense and defense. Right. They're rotating units, so I just keep staying in there. Because it was me and Mike Vaughn were the only guys who were going to make the team. Right. And Mike was an All-American from the University of Oklahoma. They were, they were you know, they did national champions and all that kind of stuff. And his system didn't allow him to pass block. So I was just a good athlete who turned himself into a lineman. I could play all the different positions. But I was so much bigger and stronger and wanted it so more than the veterans that I was I had basically a number one draft to our specials. Right. And then, you know, I didn't realize at that time because they didn't really count all that stuff. So to cut a long story short, uh, I uh, get named the starting center. I go down after dehydration with a ruptured appendix about four or five hours later after the game. So the Giants know that it directly was related to de- uh, dehydration. I remember they put me on the non-football-related injury list. If you went on the non-football-related injury list, that means you could, it was for guys that slip and fall in showers to get car wrecks. Right. If you went on the injured reserve back then, you were lost for the season. Right. And you got your full salary and you got a year in your pension. Right. Bob Tucker came to see me in the hospital. And he said to me, Bill, this organization is a little behind the time. He goes, I've been here for a long time. And Bob Tucker was a veteran and played for the Potsdam Firebirds. He had come up the way I had. He was a legendary hit New York Giant. And he said, just go in and tell him you want to go in the reserve. He said, tell him you want to come back next year. Okay. And I turned around to him and I said, no. You know, my buddy speaks, I don't want to do that. I'm a starting center. This is my job. And Larry Zonka came to see me and he, you know, he said, Billy, you know, uh, I need you back. You know, I'd like to, you know, I need you in there as soon as possible. Get yourself well. And then John Petray came to me. John had tears in his eyes. And he said to me, Bill, I'm so sorry. I said, Coach, it's okay. Now, had I sat there and gone crazy, okay, I never would have played a game of the National Football League. You never would have chance to play professional football, ever. Right. And I'm looking at, you know, basically, I think that what the Giants did to me wasn't fair. But guys that played the game long enough, we all have been dumb dirty. Right. And the guys that really love the game just keep their mouth shut and go, hey, I'll play through all this and paybacks are a bitch. And in my case, the most famous play in Giants history happened because I wasn't in there. <laughs> um, I had the miracle of the Metal So that kind of right. could, could have put a stamp on me like, I got to get out of there. And we'll save that for future shows. Sure. But what you will see when you go to my YouTube channel, I think it's really ironic. There's a little video take with me in that, in that, in the day that I ruptured my appendix. And you can kind of see where I'm at physically. So the films don't lie. Okay? And you see some of the veteran linemen right next to me. You kind of get an idea of where I'm at. Right. Okay? So, you know, I, I like to think I was like J.J. Watt back in the 70s, except the NFL wasn't ready for that because no one lifted weights the way I did and they didn't believe in hydration. Right. Okay? And they've had to learn, so it's kind of prehistoric. So a lot, you know, and the Giants organization paid a huge price uh, because of the fact that, uh, you know, the job they played left to the 49ers, and no disrespect, that have built the world championship team with guys like me. Right. Uh, you know, this is just straight business. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you got to learn that maybe when you're being done dirty or you don't feel it's, you know, it's being right, the last thing you can do is sit there and start popping off to these guys. Right. Okay, and, and, you know, going to the media and doing it. It's even worse today with social media and all right. this other stuff. And the, 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 the smartest thing you do, if you want to play in the National Football League, keep your mouth shut. Right. Okay, you do your job because let me tell you something. It's next man up and everybody's disposable unit. Right. All right, and you need to understand the concept of team and, 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 and bear the individual. And I'm looking at what Michael Wilbon said yesterday on television. Uh, and I, and I, some guy, I, I love Michael a lot. He was basically saying this guy from the uh, Astros is all about himself when he wants to eliminate minor league baseball. You know, and he wants to sit there and show 
people how smart he is so that he can move up in the ranks and all this other stuff. And I, I look back now, and there are some guys that are team players, understand the sport, have played the sport and respect the game. Then we have people that don't play the game, our executives don't understand what it takes, and they want to be on the same level as these athletes so they do these kinds of things. Right. And you have to separate the pretenders from the contenders. Right. You really do. And this is, you know, and so you can be Colin Kaepernick, it can be uh, Antonio uh, Brown, it can be an executive. Okay, guys, you know, the best thing to do is just be quiet, do your job, and control right. the things you can control. But I look back now, and over 35 or 40 years later, we had social media and something like that happened. I'd probably be rewarded with a couple billion dollars. Can only imagine. But back then, back then, you know, we don't have any media. Right. You know, we, we didn't have anything else. And I was getting all kinds of press. And I started to realize I was getting more press than I deserved. So I learned at a really young age what some of these guys are learning now. And a lot of these guys have been paid a ton of money. I so I just want to throw that out at you because I think as we move forward, that's going to give me some credibility on why, you know, people need to do the things they do because I've been in the room. I understand what's going on. Now, we'll talk later on about some other things. So I appreciate you letting me say that, Scott, because I think it's important that you understand what it takes to play professional sports today. And, you know, keep it, you know, there's nothing wrong with keeping your mouth shut. Okay, and doing your job because that's what wins battles, that's what wins championships. All right. Now let me let me uh, incorporate a couple things in here. Okay, number one, w- one of my first professional uh, football uh, assignments was with the Miami Dolphins back in the early '80s, and I worked with Don Shula for a couple of years. So, tell me about two and three day practices, winners. Okay, I understand them. I used to cover them. I used to spend a lot of time at Biscayne College. Okay, down in the Miami area, and I understand, I, and I'll tell you what, hanging around in those little uh, dorm rooms, you know, with a lot of the media, it was an interesting story, Bill, it really was, so I can appreciate what you guys had to go through as much of anything, and, you know, we're not going to get into a long, drawn-out discussion, but training camps today are like a country club compared to what they were back then, I know that for oh, a yeah. fact, not only for oh, you yeah. as players, Bill, but as for media, it wasn't easy because you're afraid you were going to miss a lot of different things. And only the few of us were allowed in there. Now, I'll tell you a quick story, and we'll move on to our final topic, okay? And that's this. Once upon a time, I got involved with a soccer game uh, with the Fort Lauderdale Strikers media against the PR people or the executives. And I tore, injured my ankle, and I was in a... Uh, uh, I had a sprained ankle, and Don Shula takes me in the office with another guy because it was a rainy day over at Biscayne College. And he says, should I put you on injured reserve? Or cut you? no, I'd rather you put me on injured reserve. <laughs> that way I'm still part of the team. And Shula just laughed at me and gave me a big smile and gave me a hug afterwards. But I understood, Bill, what it was like back then. Trust me, man. I understand. That's why we have a lot of fun when we can relate to it. We'll have more stories, but I thought I'd throw that uh-huh. in there. Yeah, I enjoy the hell out of it, Scott. You know, always enjoy talking. I'll, I'll throw this at you real quick. Um, I um, was, you know, the, the Washington Nationals, when they played in Game 7 in the Astros, right. we're sitting there trying to figure out which team was going to win. Right. There have been over 1,200 Game 7s in all sports. Right. And the uh, Nationals were the first team all right, to overcome that and win a Game 7, okay? Right. On the road, okay? No one had ever done that before. Hockey, baseball, or anything else. All right. Well, and an analytics guy would sit there and go, "You can't do that." Right. So I don't like, you know, a machine, uh, you know, dictating policy all the time on everything we do. Yeah, okay. Don't get me all started right. on yeah. analytics. That's all I'm going to tell. All right. You. Now the last thing I'm going to say, I just want to just finish up with this for the Giants. When I went in to get my paycheck for the New York Giants, they cut my salary in half, but they kept me on the active roster. Right. Now, you would think they wouldn't be able to get away with that today. Right. But I've kept my mouth shut for a long, long time. Why? I didn't want to, uh, you know, have it come back and bite me. Right. In fact, it served me really, really well because I used it as motivation. And Montreal Alouettes gave me a contract that was better than any NFL contract. That's why I went up there because of my respect for the game, because of the organization, understood what I went through, what, what I did. 
guy and how I handled it. Okay, and that's what the NFL is looking for. Uh, you know, we have a young quarterback down here uh, with Houston Texans who is going to win a Super Bowl to Sean Watson. And the reason is that in addition to being a great player, he's a true leader. Right. Okay, and, you know, you can't have circuses around your starting quarterback. Okay? And Rex Ryan came out and said it. I, if I was the coach, I would bring him around and I would bring this kid in because I'd want the circus to come along with him. Right. And, you know, and, and one of the things that Pencil is going to move back to the middle because I think people are going to start to understand that this isn't going to change. Right. You can do all the protesting that you want. Okay? This is the way it is. Okay? And maybe, you know, you can feel like you're ahead of the thing, but that's not the way our country is. That's the way history so has been. Mm-hmm. All right? And people who overcome that stuff uh, Jose Feliciano, I was listening, you know, we talked about this the other day. You know, he got up and gave that version of the uh, of the Star Spangled Banner, which I thought was awesome. Okay, but a lot of people in the American public got upset about it. Well, you know, for five, four or five years, it was really tough for him to get out of the blocks. He never said a word. He was ahead of his time. Okay, the bottom line was that he uh, wrote another song and wished you a very, very Christmas, and he's beloved by everyone. So sometimes, you know, it's how you handle adversity. Right. All right, by just keeping your mouth shut and showing your what your true talent. All right. All right, and you know that's that separates. You know, I think a lot of people that go on to do really, really great things, and uh, uh, some people who just never reach their potential because they don't handle it the right way. All right, let let's use the adversity thing to transition our last subject of the night, Bill. Okay, and the last sure. one of the night, uh, we're going to talk about Tua. Here's a guy that obviously. I think he stayed in college too long, but now I'm going to let you talk about him. We only have about 10 or 12 minutes to get this one out, but I'm sure that you can cover the necessary things that we need to do yeah, within that it's time really, it's, it's really, It's really simple. Uh, you're kind of, if, if, and this is not me saying this is the experts I'm in total agreement, and they're just reinforcing what I would already tell him if I was his agent. You're done playing college football. Right. Okay? Uh, you need to go into the draft. You're, you you were rated number one, now you're probably dropping to three. I've got some people rate them as low as 13 because right, right now we're dealing with an unknown, which is how bad you're going to come back from these injuries. Right. right. But I think it'd be a real good situation for him because someone will take a shot at him, maybe not in the first round, but the second round because of the potential. And it'll probably be a team that, you know, could use a really good quarterback. It's not putting him in and throwing him to the dogs all right, with an organization that's, you know, in the late rounds. So that's probably what's going to happen. Right. All right. And I, I just think that if I'm his agent, I'm telling him, look, I declare for the draft, finish the college ball, get with the team that's going to nurse you and let you get right. All right. Because we already know what you can do when you're healthy. Right now, we got to get you healthy. All right. So uh, a real good organization, somebody's going to take a shot at him. All right. But I don't think he's going to go, go in the first round right now because uh, of the fact that. Uh, you know, he's got some injuries, and it's an unknown right now. But that's a work in progress. A lot can happen between now and uh, the springtime when the draft comes up. Yeah, my gut. Okay, uh, he's hell on wheels when he's healthy. Yeah, okay, my... but right now he's pretty banged up. And, you know, it's a lot of miles on a young kid. Right. <clears throat> so, you know, so he's going to take a shot with him. But I don't think they you know, they also said that, uh, you know, the first round, the first quarterback pick for the draft is going to get about $30 million, right. guaranteed. All right, so for every slot they drop down, it's a million dollars. So if you drop down uh, to the second round, it's probably cost him twelve to thirteen million dollars. Well, he can make that back up in incentives once he gets healthy, and he's going to get in the right environment. So you know you'll see a team uh, that you know wants a quarterback just willing to give him an opportunity, but it's, they know that it's going to probably take him two years to get back to where he was. Okay, I'm gonna... so that's probably what's going to happen. Uh, I'll end it on this note, Bill. I having covered the game as long as I have as well. Okay. Once upon a time, a guy by the name of Jim Kelly suffered a shoulder injury, and he, at that time he was a Heisman Trophy candidate for the Miami Hurricanes. And you know what? When it was all said and done, you know, he did his pro days and he did all those things. He got drafted in the first round. So if two is going to be out of action for a while, you're only talking, what, not even before Thanksgiving. By the time the pro days come around, you're probably talking about February or March anyway. 